One minute. Good. Good. Adrian, good. Okay, so uh, we're a little ahead of the schedule, which is good. Uh, that's always a good thing, right? So um, then we can take a break a little earlier and maybe get an extended break. Ooh, it was, it was a break. <laughs> so, all right, so Micah Brown, he's uh, going to present uh, I Got 99 Problems But WAF Ain't One. So uh, it's uh, deploying a web application firewall, in case you didn't know what WAF stood for. Uh, anyways, um, Hardest IT security project he's ever completed, uh, implicit trust and support between IT security and app development. A WAF project demands networking, traditional IT architecture, cloud architecture, and app development skills. So he's going to talk about ch challenges and shortcuts and tips and tricks that he's learned deploying over 30 WAFs. So Mike is a member of the IT security engineering team at American Modern Insurance. So uh, part of the, oh, Munich. So they're out of Germany? Yes, so oh, oh. American Modern is a sub-company within the Munich Re family of insurance organizations as right. such per se. Very good, very good. So the past four years served as a lead engineer for the DLP implementations. I remember that presentation two years ago that you did here for us. So data loss prevention for the Munich R RE uh, organizations located in North and South America. Micah has learned many intricate Intricacies of what works in a successful DLP project uh, in his free time serves as the Greater Cincinnati ISSA chapter as vice president and graduated from the University of Cincinnati and holds his CISSP. So, uh, so my, hey, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we all need the uh, CISSP for some kind of work, um, although that is uh, interesting, you know. So, welcome, Micah. Thank you. All right, is this, are the audios coming in good, Adrian? Excellent. Wow, it is great to be back in front of people. I have loved the past year and all of the conferences that I've I've spoken at and attended, but it doesn't match being back in person. Now let's see if I'm smart enough to get the clicker working. Maybe you. Did it. Is it on? Oh. Let's see. Did I turn it on? Ah, there. It was ah, turned off. Gotcha. All right, so who am I? My name is Micah K. Brown. Uh, you can follow me at Micah K. Brown on the Bird app, and also you can go to my GitHub and download this, as well as many other of my talks. Uh, please be aware that my slide deck is in... T you might just have to hit slide, maybe. It should be working. It was working earlier. Working over here. Not on the screen? Please. Yeah, I don't know what you're doing. You just want to have him hit the slide? Yeah, so uh, next slide, please. I do. Okay, it looks like it's working now. Yes.
All right, so now that we've got this sorted, uh, you can go to my GitHub and you can download this or any of my talks. My slides are intentionally dense. That way, if you do find value in the content that I'm creating, you can go through, you can download it, you can use, and you can share that with people that you think it's applicable to. That being said, I'm also the co-host of the Threat Real podcast with uh, my good friend Matt, who you'll be hearing from a little bit later today. That being said, uh, just a friendly reminder that in Cincinnati, we have a bunch of great IT security groups that are here to make your professional and personal life just a little bit easier. So please feel free to come and check out any and or all of our groups. So the web application firewall project that I was a part of was one of the hardest projects that I've ever been um, a member of within my IT security career. And in my mind, this is because you have to have a critical intersection of both IT security, your application developers, your infrastructure team. There's fear, there's certainty, there's doubt, because we are putting a device in between our application users and the application that is explicitly designed to stop to block traffic. And to be honest, it was kind of a running joke I had on the project, and you'll see it play out in this slide, as to how difficult this project really was. So let's start off and talk about what is a web application firewall. So a web application firewall, to me, is a compute device that sits in between your web application and the users of that application. Highly visualized, it kind of looks like this, where over on the left, we have our users. And in this case, when they go and they reach out, make a query to our web application, their traffic is first sent to our load balancer. The load balancer, because this is representing production and needs to have some level of high availability, the load balancer will take that traffic and it'll decide which of the web application firewalls to send it to. Once the traffic arrives at the web application firewall, the traffic will be decrypted, it'll be inspected, and then there'll be a permit, deny, alert decision that is taking place on that application or on that traffic. If that traffic is allowed, then it will be sent to the front end web application servers. Now, I came onto this project after the project was running for about three months, and we had kind of stalled out. And originally when I came on, we had several different web applications, about seven that we were su supposed to protect. And they're divided amongst a group of our security engineers to go through and to own the implementation of each web application firewall from cradle to grave. And something just didn't sit right with me because when you think about the various skills that you need to deploy a web application firewall, you have to, you have to go through and you have to have a certain amount of network engineering. And for me, that's where I cut my teeth in IT and IT security. I started off as a help desk admin, moved into a server admin, then to network admin before becoming a full-time IT security engineer. So I really understand traditional IT architecture and cloud architecture. Where I'm a little bit less good at and probably the most immature at is secure coding, web application development. And I knew that while I could handle the first phase, the second phase I was going to really struggle with. And the final stage is supporting the environment that you go through. And that's one where I think, at least I see, that many IT security professionals, many companies, sometimes struggle in making sure that we're, that we're taking care of our actual systems, that we're doing the process, or the needed start of day, start of week, start of month procedure. And it's my job as an IT security member of the architecture and engineering team to ensure that when I build a solution, that the people that are going to end up owning it are prepared both with the tools, the processes, and the procedures to ensure that those IT security assets 
are properly cared and maintained for. Likewise, I had another uh, gentleman that was on my architecture and engineering, Russ. And Russ, he came to IT security from a field of application security. So where he was his very strongest was where I was my very weakest. And so one night, I might have had a, 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 a rum and coke, and I thought to myself, there's got to be a better way where we can set each other up for success. And so what I worked out in my head was splitting the roles and responsibilities within the web application development team slightly different ways, in which I broke things down into a build phase, a tune phase, and a support phase. And so under that, you start at the bottom of each phase and you progress up building a secure foundation to ensure that you are successful. So this one visualization is pretty much the entire methodology that I was able to deploy over 30 WAFs in under three months. It's very efficient. It's very easy to under or to explain to people. And I think it's very elegant to go through and to implement. So, what are, what are some of the biggest challenges in implementing WAFs? Well, first off, I believe that web applications are unique in that they have a very high total cost of ownership. You have to be very vigilant in the operations day to day to make sure that the WAFs are in and are working successfully. We're going to have to overcome fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Remember, many of our IT, many of our application owners, they are judged oftentimes financially by how their uptime stats look. And now we're putting in a device that sole reason to exist is to block unwanted traffic. What if it classifies something wrong? So it's obvious that there might be a little bit of uncertainty uh, within those types of people that are motivated that way. You're also going to have to clearly define how the software development life cycle is going to go through and it's going to, how should I say, work under a WAF once it is implemented. We're probably going to have conflicts with work that's already in the app dev pipeline. Do they have enough resources to really go through and support that? And trust me, you are going to need the expertise of your app dev team in order to successfully tune your web application firewall. This kind of shocked me, but not all environments are feature by feature equal to each other. And what I mean is, in a couple of the applications that I went through and worked with, I was expecting the test, the dev, the stage, the prod to have the exact same functionality. I found that that's not always the case. So we need to make sure that we understand where there are deviations, because that's going to define where you should put your WAFs, and trust me, I really believe that you need WAFs at multiple layers because it's better to catch things lower in the environment before they get to prod. But WAFs, they also have a huge total cost of ownership. Finally, how are we going to go through and intercept traffic? So in general, you can either go through and route traffic through the WAF, either using DNS, which is my preferred method, or you can have it inspect all traffic going across a particular network segment. So let's talk about the team that we're going to need to assemble in order to be successful. First, you're going to need someone like myself under this model, the build resource. So this is somebody that has very strong networking IT architecture, possible cloud architecture, depending off your deploying in the cloud environment, strong understandings of your corporate policies. The build resource is the resource that takes from the very initial beginning, the, the discovery of the existing web application, all the way through the design, getting the approval, all the way to actually deploying the, the WAF so it's in line and seeing traffic. Then you're going to need the tune resource. This is the person that's going to take over 
from the build resource once the web application firewall is seeing traffic. And what they're going to do is they're going to work with the app dev team and they're going to say, hey, we're seeing these alerts. Is this normal traffic? If so, can we go through and just add it to our allow list? Or do we need to go through and do we need to make some sort of tweak on the back end uh, on the actual code so that we are no longer triggering this, or do we end up just continuing to block this type of traffic? And finally, you need the support team. Now this team is going to be the one that provides the 24 seven monitoring management of the devices after both the build and the tune resources step back. And in that case, they're going to need to have both the skills of the build team in terms of networking, IT architecture, cloud architecture, understanding of the environment as a whole, as well as the ability to converse with the actual development team so that uh, as alerts come up, you can go through and you can properly evaluate them. Now, we have the application team. So the first person that we're going to be spending a lot of time with is the application owner. Now this might be assigned to a senior developer, it might be assigned to a manager, that depends on application and organization. The person that is designated the application owner, they don't have to be technical, but they need to be able to go through and to listen to what the WAF team is saying and make sure that they can bring the proper people in to answer the questions that we go through and we have. The application developer, this, well hopefully you have multiple of these on, and this is going to be something that is absolutely critical for both the short and the long term success. One of the ways that we really uh, demystified any FUD that we earn trust is we created a special role in our web application firewalls explicitly for our application developers. And what we did was we wanted the application developers at any time to be able to log on to the actual GUI of our web application firewalls with read-only access. And that's for two particular reasons. The first one is I wanted them to be able to go into our performance page so that if they're seeing some quantum weirdness on the web application firewall, they could see, is the web application firewall, is it under excessive CPU, memory, disk IO, network IO, or B, if there was an active block going on. So we also allowed them to take a look at the alert section so that they could go through and they could see exactly what was going on. And finally, you're going to need a lot of testers. However many testers you get, you need more. And this is absolutely critical. And you're going to want to have both a diversity of tests at all layers of your application, test dev stage, prod, but you're also going to want to have tra or standardized tests that are repeatable. It is critical that you have just normal end user behavior testing as well as your more standardized uh, scripted testing. And another thing that's really critical in testing is both the volume and the diversity of traffic. So let's dig into my expertise, the build phase. So the first phase within the build phase is the architecture. So we want to, within our group, define our overall WAF architecture. What are we trying to do? What are the goals? What are the use cases? Then we want to build out our WAF support systems. So these are going to be things like centralized management, logging servers, licensing servers, making sure that we have a good 10,000 foot view of what we want to accomplish. Then we move into the plan and design. And this is where we start going through and we start talking explicitly on application per application. So for each application that we want to work with, we want to make sure that we start interviewing the app owner, the app devs to understand how the application really works. So I'd ask for things like going through, or do you have a data flow diagram? Do you have a networking architecture for your application? Because that is absolutely critical for you understanding where and how you can plug a WAF in. For each environment, we went through and 
outlined a basic questionnaire, everything, the who, what, where, when, why, the entire implementation support strategy. We wrote it out in what we called an implementation guide. And the implementation guide was critical because at the start it had like an executive summary. This is why we want to deploy WAFs. This is why your application is in scope. And then we go through and as we learned about their web application, we would start filling out things uh, such as current state of the web application. Then we started a future state and this implementation guide grew very quickly and it was what was critical to us is in the implementation guide it had every phase every step every configuration it had processes procedures slas that we were going to hold ourselves accountable in doing this we were going through and we were trying to be as open as we could be you could take a look at any one of the phases within the implementation guide and there is a common understanding of roles and responsibilities of it as well as app, the app dev team. And then we had visualizations of how everything was going to work together. In fact, in our implementation guides, we even had technical details like technical config snippets. We had, where appropriate, what the IP addresses would be and we'd fill them in and constantly update this document. The deal was, is that we wanted this implementation guide not only be a roadmap on how we implement, but we also wanted it to be a resource tool for the, both the app dev, that they can constantly update the current revision, as well as the support team, as well as going through, and if the app dev team was challenged by an auditor, how do you protect your application? They could take this implementation guide and say, well, one of our lines of protection is this web application firewall that we have in front. The goal was to go through and to make it as open as transparent as possible so that we could win the trust. At some point, we got the agreement of the app owner and the app devs that the plan was thorough, the implementation guide was good, and we got the green light to move on. So let's go through and talk about the cold build phase. So this is where the build resource, me, I would work with IT to stand up the initial web application firewall, be it physical, be it virtual, and then we would go through and apply a baseline configuration and get it ready to go in line. That means that we had put all of the IPs, all of the internal security policies, uh, we would get all of the plumbing in there working. Once we felt that we had the web application firewall built to a sufficient level that it was ready to go in line, we would then go to both the app dev team as well as our testers, and we would ask them to go through and leveraging host file redirection to point the actual web app on their local system instead of going to the normal DNS, instead go to the IP of our web application firewall. And then we'd ask the testers and the app dev, please do a ton of thorough testing. While they're doing those tests, I'd tap in the tune resource so that the tune resource could start going through, taking a look at the alerts, making sure that traffic was flowing as normally and go, making an initial determination, which alerts do we just ignore? Which alerts do we go through and do we escalate to the app dev team so that we can go through? Now, depending on how involved your app devs, how thorough your testing is, is going to really have a huge payoff down the road. So I, I urge you to spend a lot of time in this host file redirection testing. It's one of those things where it's going to pay off in spades later. And once again, you want both volume of traffic and diversity of traffic for your web application. At some point, you're going to get the approval from the app devs and the app owners that because of their testing, that they are confident that we are effectively done a baseline tuning of the web application firewall. And they're saying, okay, we're ready to go in line. So as the web application firewall is still in transparent non-blocking mode, alerting only mode, we would go through and we would secure a maintenance window, submit a change request, get all of that good stuff together before actually 
putting the web application firewall online. And to be honest, this was one of the easiest change controls <laughs> that I've ever ran because I don't have access to the DNS. We've already proven out through host file redirection that the traffic will flow. So I would just have a conference call. I'd kick off the conference call about five minutes before we were scheduled to go in line. I would ask for a quick go, no go, making sure that uh, app dev felt comfortable moving forward. And if we had a go, then as soon as the maintenance window opened, I'd ask my networking team resource, please update the DNS record to point to the public interface of the WAF. And we'd allow DNS replication to take place. Beforehand, we'd knock the TTL down really low so that, you know, it's only a couple minutes failover or for before convergence. And once that converged, you know, I was testing it both on my personal device, if, it, if this site was open to the public, I was testing it from my corporate sites, I was just making sure that traffic did seem to be flowing. And I, not only was I looking at does the logon page render correctly, but I was also taking a look at things like the internal cryptography of the certificates, making sure that it matched before and after. And generally, the validation testing that I did, once that DNS took over, it was like five minutes or so. And then I'd turn it over once again to the application team and the testing team. Once again, we spent about one hour, two hours, depending on the group, where they were going through and just running various use case tested. And once again, I highly recommend a mix of automated testing, uh, a mix of in-person testing, test a bunch of function, as much functionality as you can. Uh, and once again, I know you're going to get tired of me saying this, volume and diversity of traffic is key. But at the end of the maintenance window, we'd ask, I'd ask, are we good? And if everyone said, well, said they were comfortable with it, we would go through and we would simply close out the maintenance window as a success. At this point, I have never had to pull a web application firewall during a maintenance window. It was very straightforward as long as you do the proper host file testing ahead of time. So now, let's talk about where I'm my weakest, and that's our tune phase. So, when that maintenance window ends, a magical thing happened, at least for me. That web application firewall was transferred from my phase over to the responsibility of the tune phase. So I was done. I was out, Jerry. So one of the things that we need to remember is at this point, we're still in transparent learning mode because we're trying to go through and build up trust in the process. And of course, we're doing this first in the lower level environments, working our way up to the higher level environments. So during the first week, first two weeks, first three weeks, once again, it's going to depend on your organization, the trust that you have with your app dev team will be in the initial tune phase. And during this phase, we want to go through and be meeting at least daily between the IT security tuning resource and the app dev team in which you're going to go through and you're going to look at each and every alert. And it's critical that you look at all alerts. We fell into a trap in where we went through and were prioritizing alerts based on the number of occurrences. And while that really helped us whittle down the number of alerts we were getting quite quickly, one of the traps was is we were not looking at the one or two offs, the niche functionality, the certain processes that only happen once a week, once a month, once a quarter. And so when we did eventually go through and go into blocking mode, what ended up happening is, yeah, 99.998% of the traffic worked great, but there was some niche functionality, say, charge back to ACHs, that was not working. That was a huge deal, even though it was a low probability functionality event. So we want to make sure that we're being thorough in our testing. But at some point, as the tuning resource and the app devs me, you'll go through and you'll see the actual number of alerts coming out is lessened as you do your tuning. 
And whatever your metric is to define success, that's going to be up to your app dev, to your own internal risk process. But eventually you're going to get there. And generally I found out it was like one or two weeks within our environment. So it can happen really quick. And when you hit that place, you're going to be in a position where you can proceed into blocking mode. So let's talk about going into blocking mode. Once again, it's critical. We are guests in our applications, owner's application. So we need their full buy-in, which, which is why I am so adamant that we treat them as a trusted partner and get their approval. Once again, we go through, we create a maintenance window, we submit the needed change work, and we implement this via a bridge. Now keep in mind, I'm out of this at this point, so our tuning re resource, Russ in this case, he would actually go through and he'd run the bridge call. And the bridge call went very simple. Uh, he adopted, you know, five minutes before, get a go, no go. If go, he would log into the GUI. Uh, of course, each web application is going to be a little bit different on how you do this, but it was a two minute process once the maintenance window opened to where we would go from transparent learning mode into blocking mode. And then once again, we would go through and we'd start off with our testing. Once again, I know you're tired of me saying this, both diversity and volume of traffic is critical. At the end of the testing, we would have a, uh, a success, non-success. And once again, we never had to back out of a change control when we were going into blocking. Uh, because we did the relevant testing ahead of time. But it is very critical to understand that you might run into some issues. So let's talk about the support phase. So for me, it is critical, and this was actually outlined in the implementation guide, for me to set up my support resources to be successful. So I would provide them with day in, day out support tasks. I give them start of day, start of week, start of month procedures. I would urge them to have regular review meetings with app dev. What does that look like? Is it bi-weekly on Tuesday, Thursdays? Is it the start of week? Is it at the end of week? That's up and it's to your app dev team and your own individual organization. We needed to address how are we going to do move ad change tickets, troubleshooting, performance testing procedures, patching procedures, documentation on where they can get the organizational documentation, making sure that they have logins to your WAF's not only helpline, but their support center. And of course, training. I worked very hard, I was very open that whenever I was doing work on a WAF, I always invited my, the people that are going to take over ownership of it, they're always invited as optional. I wanted to be very open, very transparent, and allow them to learn the best ways that they learned. So now, let's get into the nitty gritty deep architecture. So, if we're on premise, are you going to use physical machines? Are you going to use virtual machines? For what I did, we used all virtual or cloud machines. How do we intercept traffic? Here you can go through and you can use DNS or you can inspect all traffic on a certain network segment. Personally, I prefer DNS because it's much faster, much safer to go through and to switch in case you have to go through and bypass the WAF for any way, shape or form. We wanna make sure that our management ports are on a internal protected VLAN and the web application server should not be internet accessible once the application is protected by a WAF. So make sure that we are taking sufficient steps to make sure that someone cannot bypass the WAF by doing any trickery, say, with their host file or any trickery with DNS poisoning. So what does... Uh, the WAF look like on premise? Well, it's pretty simple. Here you can see I've got uh, the top two WAFs are production. Then we go through and we have a pre, a UAT, and a test at the bottom. With that being said, we have a load balancer up in front of our production just so that we have a bit of high availability. And generally, 
within our production, the WAFs would go through and pass the traffic to a sub VLAN where our front end application servers were residing. So let's talk about the cloud. Are we going to go through and implement in the same cloud container? Or are we going to go through and host in different cloud containers? If you're implementing in the same cloud environment, that can be the quickest way to actually deploy. But within my organizations, we give our cloud devs a lot of rights. And because we give them a lot of rights, they could do some high trickery. They could go and they could juggle where IP address is, for example. They could uh, make edits to network ed or to the NATs, network address translation, that would allow them to go through and to bypass the web application firewall without any approval, without IT security knowing. If you're implementing in a different cloud environment, how do you pass traffic over the internet? Do you use VNet peering? Do you use a VPN? What if you're going through and deploying your WAFs in cloud A and your web applications are in cloud B? These are all some things that you need to go through and you need to consider, especially all the way back at the architecture, because that's really where your blueprint is going to be defined. How do you manage your WAFs? Do you have hardened jump servers? Or do you go through and do you trust direct internet logon, especially for cloud facing systems? These are all things that you need to go through and you need to consider, especially during the architecture. Now, our initial plan was to deploy in the same container. But as I said, there are some risks it could allow the web application team to go through and to bypass. So instead, what we did within the same cloud instance that our web applications were in, we spun up a new container that only IT security had access to. And then we trusted the direct cloud routing because the traffic between our WAFs and the front end web servers, that was strongly encrypted with uh, the proper TLS protocols that we found that that type of intra VNet routing within the same cloud environment was acceptable based on our rules, laws, regulations, and organizational policies. Once again, this might look a little bit different for you, for your organization. You might want to run a VPN, you might want to do VNet pairing, but that, those are considerations that you should definitely talk with your cloud team on. So let's talk about policies. You know, nothing better than talking policies on Saturday morning, right? So do we want to have one single policy to rule all of the web application? Ideally, I, really, I used to think yes, and I was wrong, and you should mock me for it, because what we found was certain part of our web applications behave a little bit differently. And if we were to go through and if we were going to create exceptions based on niche functionality, that would have applied to the entire site. So instead, what we did is it might be called a micro policy, a parent child policy. The name differs between each of uh, the web application firewalls, but we created micro policies that would apply to certain more challenging areas, say a file upload option. I spoke to this earlier, but often our lower level environments are not identical. They'll be close, but in some cases you might be going through a missing functionality. And once again, web application firewalls, they're very expensive. They have a high total cost of ownership. So my recommendation is to evaluate where is the most effective place to start inspecting your traffic to deploy web application firewalls. And to me, that would be at the same level that has feature parity with production. Pay attention to cryptography, especially in the lower level environments. Uh, one thing that I found was some of our lower level environments were using wildcard crypto cryptography. In fact, some of our clouds were using the vendor supplied uh, wildcard cryptography, which uh, 
we had to switch over to internally minted PKI certs for those environments so that we could actually go through and inspect the traffic. We need to make sure that we're using the proper cryptographic ciphers. It doesn't make sense to spin up an entire web application firewall if you're still using TLS 1 and 1.1. That'll give my poodle a heartbreak. And if you got that joke, spot on. Indeed. So, naively, remember, application development is where I am my absolute weakest. I assumed that we were going to learn alerts in the lower level environments. So I expected a normal policy push would we'd find something in test, we would then push the fix in test, then promote the fix to stage, and then promote the fix to prod before the code actually got updated so that we weren't running into bugs in our deployment cycles. What quickly became apparent was because we didn't have as much volume or diversity of testing in our lower level environments, we started to see things, see bugs for the first time in stage and prod, which meant not only did we have the normal bottom up type of policy pushes, but we also had from the top down and even middle out. So this was something where we had to go through and create explicit policies, uh, tactical game plans on how to support especially the, what I called the reset policy, so from prod down or the middle out pro po policy push in which we found something, say for example, in stage. So on policy, what triggers a policy push? Is it based on sensitivity of the bug? Is it by number of the bug? Or do you tie your policy pushes in line in some way to your actual production code? pushes. Now, once again, this is going to be about defining that SDLC life cycle. This is where, you know, you're going to want to go through and include explicitly your actual app dev team as part of this. We want to go through and we want to understand how do we do critical pushes and how is that defined when a critical push is required. When demoting a policy from a higher level environment to a lower level environment, we want to make sure that we have defined within that rule, because let's face it, our test environment probably has slightly different naming conventions throughout all aspects of that application than our testing, than our prod, especially when we're talking about the references to different servers that each environment is talking to. So we need to understand what changes do we have to make to each rule so that we can safely deploy to the other environments to make sure that those exceptions are tailored for that specific environment? Do we want to promote and demote a single learning suggestion? Or instead, do we want to go through and promote, demote the entire policy between environments? We've already gone through and talked a little bit about the parent-child policies, uh, the micro policies that you can go through and implement, and I really do think that is something that really helped us optimize the protection to our web application firewalls. And finally, how do we track all of the... Oh, shoot, sorry. I've been talking... <laughs> So this is what I was talking about in terms of the policy pushes. And how do we track all of this, not only for our sake in troubleshooting, but also for our internal audit? With that being said, this is the actual change script that I used every time that I put a web application firewall in line. So at the beginning of the call, five minutes before the policy, you know, I'd take a roll call, go no-go. i then go through and I had a simple table like this showing what I wanted the networking team to go through and change the IP address to. We would go through, wait for the actual change to happen. Once it did, I would do my testing in block two. 
we go through, we modify any firewall rules, cloud ACLs to prevent WAF bypass in stage three. That would generally be our networking team. Step four was going through and actually doing the testing. And step five was going through, and if we did have to do a rollback, just having documentation on that rollback. That being said, I want to thank you very much. It was an honor to be back and presenting in front of uh, you today. Any questions? Yeah. So, in my experience, the detections that we had were detected not as a part of this actual event, um, well, as part of my project. I always did have a great line to our SOC, so if I did find something, we definitely had our own incident response plan ready to rock and roll, but I never had to pull that trigger. Any other questions? Can you turn the house lights on? Try to see up here. <laughs> no, 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 no. A little more for everybody to see. Okay, more questions? No? No. Micah, thank you. Uh, again, 